Hello, I am Chris Zaloff. I am the creator of the comic book Crit, C-R-I-T. And uh, you can find us at homebrewedcomics.com with all of our books there now. And right now you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic creator. I've just seen his work. He's a reference from, of course, Jeff Haas, who was on the show a couple of weeks back. And he's a longtime friend of the show as well, too. So he suggested Chris come on the show. We're joined today by the ever talented Chris Selloff. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Did I get your last name right? You did. <laughs> That's the first. Okay. I get yep. need to buy a lottery ticket then. Very few people get that name right off the bat. So congrats. <laughs> awesome. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a comic creator and, of course, your project itself, tell us who you are and what you're all about. I created the book called Crit. It's based off of a homebrewed Dungeons & Dragons game that me and my friends uh, have been playing going on four years now. So it's an action adventure comic filled with twists and turns. If, and if you're familiar with D&D, you know, every action and reaction in the story is based off of the roll of the die. Some people have better luck with dice than others, that's for sure. Yeah, as you can tell in my book, so my players sometimes have good days and sometimes have bad days. I think this is the first time I've seen a, a comic and D&D &D kind of merge together. I, I've seen comics that want to be D&D &D campaigns, and I've seen D&D &D campaigns that are thinking about becoming a comic, but I've never seen the merger. So yeah, I think this is the first in 13 years. Yeah, I get that a lot, um, which is which is really cool for me. And when I started this idea, I thought it was kind of popular, to be honest with you, because it's such a easy medium to write from. You know, you've got world building done for you. You've got rules done for you. You just need to throw your players into a situation. Given our game's a little different because we took the core rules from Dungeons and & Dragons and took them and put them into a modern setting, which with 5th edition, you don't really have. So... Everything you see took about, uh, I think, four or 500 hours to create just the world itself. I think we've been playing it four years. So after four or 500 hours of creating it, and then I don't even know how many hours of playing it. <laughs> but after the first session, it just said, hey, this needs to be a comic. I didn't plan on releasing it to the asses. I originally just thought of like giving it to my players every session and saying, hey, you know, this is what it looks like. So we're on our sixth issue, ending the first chapter of the series, which is really levels like zero or one through five is what the level cap is here. And so you get to see them at the very beginning stages of their adventure. And, you know, with most campaigns, right around your fifth or sixth game is when the DM's kind of coming into his time and the players are starting to learn about their characters become being, you know, being comfortable role playing their characters. So it really expands after this. And in, in this book was the first book where first session really where everything just clicked a hundred percent. I I've loved what I've got to read too, as well. Like I love the, the characters. They're not your stereotypical characters that you create. They all have their own personalities, some conflicting and some not. Why did you want to set it in a modern setting? Because you're right. That is very rare. It's not really well seen. And did you get tired of the high fantasy dungeons and dwarves and all that other stuff? I've never been a fan of what they call vanilla D and D, which is your orcs and goblins and things. Most of the campaigns we've ever played have been, Star Wars settings, Mass Effect settings, mm -hmm. something we're familiar with. It's really hard to take players and throw them into a fantasy setting in which they don't know anything about because there's knowledge that you have, say, about I'll use uh, one of the reasons we used Mass Effect as our first campaign was because it was very accessible to us. You know, players didn't have to wonder how things worked because we knew we had played so many of the Mass Effect games. We, we're you know, huge, huge Mass Effect fans even to this day. It was very easy. Whereas with Dungeons and Dragons, you'll have a player or two that don't know how things work. And the reason I went with modern setting was the whole pitch to my friends was, hey, you're you. You wake up tomorrow after work. Something happened. You have superpowers. Very simple because... When I got the guys back together, it had been 10 years since we had played together, and some of them hadn't even played D&D &D in those 10 years. Mm -hmm. So getting someone to be familiar with role-playing and then having to make a character and get into those character shoes, it, it was going to be a challenge for a couple of them. And I thought, hey, it's going to be real easy if you play yourselves 
in this setting and this is what happens. There is some downside to it because some of my players know certain things that I don't know. You know, we all have our own specialties in life and they'll throw something at me and they're like, well, this works this way. And I'm like, oh, I didn't really know that. Let me use Google real quick. Crap, you're right. Didn't think about that. <laughs> it made it very easy to begin a story and have people, you know, my players be able to write the right to it because it's them. And you mentioned the jokes and the... um camaraderie and like just the overall personalities of the characters and the reason we're able to get such unique personalities is because those are real people playing themselves we're not having to write the characters you're not having to develop these characters because they've been doing it for between 30 and 40 years they've been a lot so they know how they would react they know things they would say and i have it recorded so they can't argue with me <laughs> <laughs> The the best uh, character you can always create is one that you know yeah. yourself. So. Exactly. Then looking at yourself as a creative person, you know, give us a bit of a background about yourself creatively, because I love the art style. I love everything that you're putting together. And obviously your D&D campaign is written itself. But as a creative person, how did you come about your creativity? So I never thought I'd be a comic creator. Um, if you can tell, you know, I have, uh, well, on this side. Um, mm -hmm. My amplifiers and stuff. I was a professional musician for six years. We got signed onto a small record label that got bought by Sony Records and lived the dream for quite a while. And I say the dream because you know I literally was a starving artist. I was homeless for a while and everything. When this came about, it was just something I wanted to do. I I've drawn before, but never anything to this caliber. Um, no pun intended. And. I, I, caliber is a character in my, game, in my book but i've never i never really thought of myself as an artist now my wife is phenomenal um she is absolutely phenomenal i envy some of her skill but i'm blessed because when i first started drawing going down this path i, I, I love telling people this story it's embarrassing but i love telling it so i spent three months working on the original issue zero that we never really released it was a stretch goal on one campaign and so very few people even have it. I had spent months working on this and I went to her and I said, Hey, I drew a comic book. You know, I've known my wife. We were best friends 11 years before we got married. We've been married almost four years when I showed this to her. 15 years I've known this woman and I've seen her talents and everything. And I show her this book and we're in bed watching TV. She pauses TV and she skims through, and hands me back my tablet, you know, turns the TV back on and she says, it's okay. I put my head down in shame for a moment and I said, thanks. And we watched TV. And the next day I grabbed the iPad out and I started working on some more stuff. And I said, well, what do you think of this? And she was like, well, it looks like his, his legs broken because his legs need to be over here. His arm shouldn't be going this way. Should be going like this. And I said, oh, okay. So I have a lot to learn. She you know, edited really all the artwork for the first few books. Every panel I would show her and she would make some adjustments. Um, there's still some things like perspective wise that I'm, I, I struggle with it. as an artist. We're always trying to like challenge ourselves and book four. When I was finishing that, that was my, my, my fourth book I'd ever drawn. And she came to me and said, I don't really need to edit this stuff. You're doing fine. So when I started book five, I started challenging myself. Cause if I'm already good with, with these perspectives and the things I've been doing, well, I want to take it up a notch. And so on some of the pages, I'll go to her and I'll say, Hey, what do you think of this? Cause I have one panel in the book where a character is literally trying to like jump out and I wanted to draw him jumping out of the page. She's like, Oh, his ankle looks broken here. Let me just fix this. Her way of fixing is like, you know, going and erasing thing and then rough sketching. So I have to like fix it all. Um, she doesn't make it easy for me. That was it. So, and then the other day I changed, uh, I had this one perspective down a hallway, which perspective shots are just hard. I've talked to a lot of artists and they're hard for everybody. Yeah. She just moved some things around real quick for me and said, you know, you have to just do this. And I said, oh, okay, thank you. I'm happy to have her constructive criticism and blessed at the same time. Sometimes it's, it sucks <laughs> being, being told that, hey, this isn't that good. That's where the ego goes, goes out the window. And I remember that this is an ever-evolving talent, you know, if not something that you're just good. It's not like playing the piano where – you learn your songs and you can continue on or playing guitar and, and you can write your songs. This is something where my big thing with going to Kickstarters and asking people for money was if I'm going to, 
be out there asking people to invest time and money into my series. I want to be able to invest back into myself that same time and effort to show them that it's worth it. Sometimes it hurts hearing those things, but then you see the final product and I'm like, okay, I don't mind asking five bucks for this. <laughs> then looking at yourself, you know, for, for doing this and being a musician and being a comic creator, you know, the, those are great uh, create, creative outlets, I should say. Uh, how did music help you be a creative person? Oh man, I've, I've been missing playing music for, I stopped in 08 was my last show that I played and I had been missing it since and doing comics kind of filled that void. I think playing music really gave me that creative drive. It also set me up for some things that in comics you would never you know, think about. I was signed to a record label, so there is a business aspect to it. And I, although they're two different mediums, they're navigated very similarly. So I mean, I'm able to navigate through some of this stuff a little bit easier than some of the guys I know because I've had to do it. I've had to have an LLC before. I've had to pay taxes on, you know, your hobby. Um, I've had to have management. I've had to have all these things. And oddly enough, some of the guys that I worked with in the record label business now own comic book shops. And so that's been nice. But creatively, it just it just sets the tone for how hard you're willing to work to get your stuff out there. You know, like I said, I was homeless. I was willing to give up everything for a little while to, to focus on being a musician. I moved away from home at random. I'm in North Carolina because one day I just said, Hey, the music scene up in Connecticut, isn't what I want it to be. Someone told me that North Carolina is pretty good. I'll go down there for a year. If we don't get signed, I'll come home. And I worked day in and day out to get my band signed. And literally on new year's, even a year later, we had a record label signing us, you know, at a show. I think that any any passion project that you have, if you're going to do it, if you're going to put yourself out there, especially for people, just put as much of you that you can into it because you're going to get that back. It might not be immediate, but eventually you will get that back. And seeing that firsthand, being able to experience it and having, you know, random people walk up to you and go, Oh yeah, you're that guy from that, you know, that kind of stuff still feels good. So, you know, it just sets that tone for the amount of effort and work you're willing to put into something that you enjoy. You know, as a, as a writer, as a comic creator, you know, what was the first thing that you wrote or created that you realized that made you realize that I could do this as a career? With crit, it would be the end of book one. Everyone said that I was doing it wrong because I won't give away the spoiler at the end of that, but they said, that's not how you want your book to end. And I said, well, that's how my campaign ended. So I don't want to change it. And I, I also said, I had a lot of fun. If I had fun, then someone else is going to find it fun. And that's all that matters. When I got the actual reactions after we shipped the book, and I got to also say that my first Kickstarter failed. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a social media account. I didn't have any resources whatsoever to show the book. I needed 500 bucks to pay a colorist. And I asked for 1500 just because market research said, ask for 1500. That, that everything I said, everything I read said, you want to ask for like 1500. Um, I did the math over and over again for everything that I needed. And they were like, well, you want to ask, you know, you have taxes that come out, you have this and that. And, and Everybody said 1500 bucks. I said, okay, cool. We'll ask for 1500. How Kickstarter was pitched to me to begin with was you put your project on there and people throw money at it verbatim, how it was said to me. And I had no clue what it was. I said, well, Hey, we'll try it. It fell flat. A buddy of mine reached out and said, Hey, I see that you're doing comics now. Yes. He's like, well, everything you do, you put everything into. So how much money do you need? And I told him and uh, he's like, well, I'm sitting on a private jet right now and I will just send you the money you need. And he sends me the money. Very independently wealthy man. I used that money to give all of the, I got the comics done. I contacted everybody that was on the Kickstarter. And I said, hey, I had a, you know, I had somebody invest in the, in the book. So here's a free copy. You know, you, you, I don't need your money. Somebody else paid for it. Thank you for believing in my project. The reactions I got once the books got in their hands really solidified that I should be doing this because I got awesome feedback. And mind you, I had just come off a book where my wife looked at me and said, it's okay, right? 
I was nervous because my art at the time, when you know, book one, you're seeing me at my, my most raw potential. Any creative person will tell you that's tough. That is very tough to put yourself out there like that, knowing that, you know, you're not as good as Jim Lee, right? Or you're not as good as these other artists that you see even on Instagram. And I'm like, well, I'm not like those guys, but Hey, my story is awesome. And I know that a good story can carry okay art, but okay art can carry a bad story. And I had that much faith in my story. And it, it came back to me and it said, yeah, people like it. And I said, okay, well, if they like this, well then just wait till you see the next book when I take it up a notch in the art. And then the book three and book four, you know, every book you're going to get a better version of me. And that, that's what really set the tone for me. And that's what really motivated me was getting that feedback. We did a live YouTube recently with all the creators. It's really hard to get them as even one of them didn't even want his face on there. He, he's not a very social person, which is why D&D is great for some of us, right? It's a good outlet. And we're on there and they were like, well, you know, we've known Chris a long time. And, you know, even without the Kickstarters and all that stuff, he'd probably shove this stuff down your throat. <laughs> <laughs> I like to stress the people that creating comics isn't a career for me right now. And that's something I learned, you know, when, you, when you're a struggling musician, you know, you learn playing the, the VFWs and the basements and all these things. You don't play those to make money. You play them to get your stuff out. And eventually, the more you do the free work is when you build the fan base. And then that's when you see the fruits of your labor. You have to give that stuff away for dirt cheap because you're a nobody in the grand scheme of things. And there are a thousand people right now on Kickstarter with super, superhero comic books. You know, what makes crit different? Well, I'll tell you what makes crit different is I'm not in it to do anything else but get what I think is an awesome story out to people. You're, you're, it's literally my friends being stupid at a table for six hours a month. And that, that's what makes us different. Isn't that I have a writing team and I have this ex extraordinary background in comic books. It's that at the core of the book, it is about having fun. And the number one review that I get back every single time is your book is fun. I had somebody ask me, oh God, is that what you wanted? You know, I had a, I had a marketing guy that I, I fired recently after this. He goes, the guy didn't really say a lot of great things about your art. And he said, your book was just fun. I'm like, isn't that what it's about? And I know my artwork isn't that great. My artwork is better every book. It's why I don't draw my own tattoos. It's why I don't do these things is because I know tomorrow is going to be better than today. At the end of the day, I know that my art, I've seen, I picked up books at comic book shops from Marvel. And I know my, my art, you know, can contend with some of those guys. So I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm just saying, you know, hey, the, the story is fun and that's what it's about. And he didn't understand that. And I think that that is what we want. I just want people to read the book and say, that's fun. Because there's so many things in life, you know, like you read a superhero book, you read a vigilante book, you read different things. And they're like, they dive hard into some realism thing, or they dive hard into some dark story or some drama or whatever it is. And while we have some of those aspects, we're still throwing out pop culture references every five seconds. We're all sh shooting guns because, hey, we can, and we're having fun. And the whole point in D&D &D is to escape you know, the reason we got together every month was to escape the mundane lives that we had created over 10 years. The reason we stopped playing D&D &D 10 years ago was because careers, family, you know, life happened. And yes, being a, da a dad and a husband and a, a career is great, but sometimes it's really good to escape. And that's what crit is, is our escape. So you're not going to be hit heavy handed with anything that, you know, might bring you down on your normal day. It's not going to be in our comic book. It's not going to be this punch in the gut every once in a while. It's going to be what, you know, at the end of the day, when, when I say what I want this to be for other people is I want to be, you know, on the, like what Star Wars was to me as a kid was this awesome escape into this world where anything could happen. And just knowing that this is Dungeons and Dragons gives you the, the hope that anything can happen, right? The big, overarching goal for us is once crit is finished you know we have a plan for 40 books it was 36 we just upped it to 40 because they wanted to play a little longer but this end of a uh, of crit we want to set this up to create a world now a, a completely changed version of the world we live in now 
It is a mix of modern world with Dungeons and Dragons. So you have, you know, monsters and things and this new setting. And I want to give that to people to create their own campaigns and their own stories and then submit those to us. And then we can play with those and maybe they exist in our world, just like what, you know, George Lucas did with Star Wars. A lot of those books and a lot of those things like fan fiction, people would submit to him and he would say, oh, this is cool. I'm going to make this canon. And I think that's what we want to do eventually is be able to open up our world to people to have fun in because it's fun for us. So therefore it is going to be fun for someone else. It's at its core. It's just fun. You know, seeing as this is like a, a live action version of D and D turned into a comic book. What did you have to edit out of the book? Because I'm sure there are some stories that <laughs> quite literally couldn't make it into the book. Um, we have a, like a comic strip that I've started getting some people in on, which is called Caliber's Corner. And <laughs> if you read the book, you can understand why Caliber gets edited heavily. Especially in the very beginning, he was a murder hobo. And if you play D&D, you know what a mur murder hobo is. He just wanted to kill everything. I had to edit a lot of the murder out of the book because originally it was going to be there. The language and everything was going to be there. We were going to be cussing like we normally do. But one of our players said, hey, you know, I want my kid to be able to read this. I was like, well, your kid, you know, she can watch My Hero Academia, right? And that has some, a little bit of language, a little bit of violence, right? Well, I'd say a lot of violence because it's a bunch of people beating each other up. He said, yeah, but we don't have some eyes of blowing somebody's head off, right? And screaming the F word five times. I said, okay, fair enough. So I like to keep it at that like TV 14 rating. Like if I wouldn't let my daughter watch this, then we're going to edit it. What we found is it really doesn't hurt the story at all, taking out some violence and language, because it's not like Punisher, right? You take the violence and everything out of Punisher and you really kind of like lose the core of what Punisher is. He's a, he's brutal. We can show brutality without showing that brutality, if that makes any sense. Yes. It's not going to hurt to walk into a room and see some guys down on the ground, you know, some blood, right? Like, that happens on, in cartoons. That happens everywhere in cartoons now. You don't have to show caliber or bones going in there and just slamming these guys around and body slamming them in, in the ground. We can have the character walk in and that scene be there. We don't have to show it. And crit, we balance the show and the tell a lot to kind of cover some of the... Um, choice language and choice actions that happen in the book. So Caliber's nickname in the book is DeCasso, okay? And that's because for there for a while, he would run around with a spray paint can or even around with a pen or a knife, and he'd carve penises in the people's cars. He'd spray paint penises onto everything because that in-game was what he wanted to do. And so I created a Caliber's Corner for all of his crazy antics that are never going to make it into the book. We do them in a small little Sunday comic kind of setting. And right now I'm, I've got about three of them done. I've posted two of them. And both of them, he's destroying something that belongs to Richter, who is the, the you know, commander in chief, I guess you could say. He screws with everybody, but it's funny. But it still doesn't make the book because it's just out of place. It doesn't, it, for me to put that in the book would be taking the reader out of the, of the moment. So I'm like, hey, all these out of moment things that happen, because it happens in D&D, &D, every DM will tell you, I'm just going to put those to the side and we'll release them here and there as these little Sunday comic shorts. So that way people can still experience them and see the, the, the chaos that this kid can create. But we don't have to take you out of the story to show them. That's where the editing comes in. That and some of the fight scenes, because D&D can be a lot of repetitive fights. I'm going to walk up and punch this guy. I'm going to walk up and punch this guy. Hey, guess what? I'm going to walk up and punch this guy, right? or I'm going to shoot him. That's why you see some of the, the ability names that they call out, because as an artist, you can only draw flames coming out of a guy's hands so many different ways. And to the reader, it's like, oh, cool, he's shooting his flames in a certain way. Well, no, they're different move names because some come from the hands you know, towards you, some are a straight line, some there's different move names and they react differently. Yes, he's doing arguably the same basic thing of shooting hands out of his, or fire, fire out of his hands, but he's doing it in different ways. And so that's why I'll have him call a move out. You know, it's very anime to do, which is fine. You know, it, it exists, so it makes sense. It's like, wow. And they even, 
they're very self-aware. So Caliber makes fun of them all the time. I'm like, you guys are just, you guys are just calling your moves out still. Like, what is this? And that's how I handle a lot of the stuff that needs to be edited is I either make fun of it, right? Or I cut it out. It doesn't, we don't need to have every punch. We don't need to have every gang member getting beat up because it's redundant. We've seen it a hundred times. I can draw a five, 500 different ways and you've seen it. The fighting doesn't make the characters, right? Again, I'll, I'll lean on Punisher for a moment. Showing Punisher, you know, going down on one knee and shooting a guy three times and then double tapping and then grabbing his shotgun and blowing another guy away. Like those moments for a character like Punisher make sense because they're showing, again, his brutality in combat. You don't have to know how brutal my guys are. They're going to beat up the bad guys. They're going to probably win low-level fights pretty easily. I just want to show it. We're going to we're going to move on because that moment between the fight scenes is where all the character development happens, where you get to see them banter and talk about looting the dead bodies. And oh god, the boss is going to be mad because you killed that guy. You know, like we're not supposed to kill people. We're supposed to be these uh, vigilantes or these heroes that the company wants to market. You know, that's that's what I lean on. I don't lean on the fight scenes, and yeah. you could easily get caught up in it. So, what is your creative kryptonite then? My creative kryptonite. That's a good one. I've never been asked that before. Uh, I would say me as an individual, my kryptonite is over-explaining. And I think a lot of creative people suffer from that. I'm blessed to have Brad and Terrell there to balance me out. The issue one, when it was first written, was much different. They, they really didn't think that I was going to go through with all this, to be honest. I remember calling them and saying, hey, book one's about to go out. Do you guys want to do a read through with me and make sure it looks good? Mind you, I used a lot of their own dialogue and I used a lot of their dialogue. And they were like, man, we need to cut this down. They were like, Chris, this is a lot. I'm like, yeah, but you know, the reader needs to see this and they need to understand this. And Brad was like, yeah, but you show that right here. So just let the artwork speak for itself. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so still to this day, I'll have a plan for something or I'll write something like when I'm scripting out because I, I record all these sessions and then I spend hours listening back to them before I go to the art table. And I'll sketch out, okay, this is what the dialogue should be. And I'll just make rough draft dialogue, rough draft on um, the art. And I'll send it over to them. And Brad will be like, yeah, we can cut about half of that dialogue out because you literally see it happening on the panel. So we don't need to worry about that. Or he'll say, hey, cut this out and add maybe a little bit more dialogue here. That way we can kind of do a better job explaining it. Or the best one, yeah, just scrap the whole thing and do it this way. <laughs> and... So I'm, I'm blessed to have that team behind me that can balance me because we all have different storytelling techniques. I'm the over explainer. As you can see, I have a lot of passion in what we do and I want people to understand that, Hey, this is what's happening. It took me a couple of books for and getting feedback from people for, to realize, Oh, they do get it. Okay. Okay. And Brad, Brad said, he's like, you know, the last thing you want to do is over explain the book because you're going to have people that get bored of the dialogue or you're going to have some people that just feel like you think they're dumb and you don't want to do that. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> Looking at then your, your group, your core group of, of mm -hmm. course, this D&D game and into the characters that you've created. If you could sum up each one of your, I'm going to say team members in one word. Give their, give their name and what would their corresponding word be? Bowler is hard-headed. Caliber is sarcastic. Spectre is overcompensating. And Bones is confused. If I was to use one word to describe them all. And I know if Austin never reads this and sees this and is like, what do you mean overcompensating? He spends a lot of time trying to be like use his, his abilities to the best that he can and sometimes i think it takes away from his ability to have fun which i show that in the game as he's he's the youngest member of the team and so i know when he came into the team he was trying to overplay maybe to show that he, he was worthy of being in the, in the group i portray that in the story as if he's the youngest member of the team trying to show his place in the team which they go hand in hand but i think the rest of them that fits really well. Bones is definitely confused because the first session he played, he barely knew 
the, the group. I had brought him in because Reach, uh, my friend Obi, who plays Reach, he kind of comes in and out. And so, so Reach, Reach is creepy. We're just going to use that word because it's true. He, he literally got kicked out of or he Austin left our group chat because he sent tentacle porn into our group chat. So that makes sense. Yeah, that happened. And it's in the, in the book where he gets yelled at for it. He loves shock value. And if he thinks that he will get a reaction from doing something, he's going to post it. And usually it's a bad reaction and we usually delete it out of the group chat. But Reach had some personal stuff come up, you know, with his family and everything. And he couldn't make a lot of sessions. So I put it in um, a friend of mine, Ryan Kidd. We had played D&D before and I prepped him. I said, hey, you know, it's kind of crazy. You know, they do a lot of stupid stuff. And he said, oh, I, I played D&D before. I get it. And I said, well you've never played with these guys before it's like playing with me times 10 and he shows up and i'm like all right now here's the situation and he watches it unfold as that they had to and this is actually what's going on in book five they have to take over this big facility and you would think they have the ammo they have the powers they have all these things to really tactically come in at this facility and they're like no we want to drive our van as fast as we can break through the gate jump out screaming and this guy's sick, this guy got hit by a car, this guy's trying to vomit. And when they're distracted, we're going to beat him up. And he's like, we're going to do what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's how this game goes. <laughs> I don't think that they're going to do something stupid like that. I really thought, hey, we're going to take the tactical approach. No, nope, we're going to take the dumbass approach. And it works because they just happen to roll really well. And I failed all my roles. So the guards got taken out by a bunch of guys pretending to be cosplayers that had drank and smoked too much. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> that was my face when, we, when they did it. I was like, okay, that happens. <laughs> Jeez, I almost want to play a virtual portion of it. Just throw me in as like a journalist or something. Eventually, we want to get there. I've had a few people ask about that. And I've brought it to the guys a couple times. The hesitancy comes from... That is our time, you know, and that's it's a very vulnerable time for us as it is because some of them aren't used to role playing. And we're so far into our story that they really are role playing these characters now. They're not playing themselves as much. Yes, it's, it's based on their decisions, but like, especially I'll, I'll use Boulder as an example. Every decision Terrell makes about Boulder he puts himself in Boulder's shoes, Boulder's experience says, Boulder's gone through this. What would Boulder do? And I've had to even sometimes bring him back a notch and be like, Terrell, remember, you are Boulder. He goes, yeah, but I'm not the guy that watched a freaking kaiju come out of the water and attack my team. How would I, as me, be if this happened and I watched all this happen and then this stuff happened? Like, where would I be at? And so he really puts himself in those shoes. And I think that can be hard to put yourself there when you have a stranger watching you. I, I commend LARPing and those things because people that go out there and just meet up with strangers and they put themselves in these role-playing situations, I envy them because I could not do it. I want to do it one day just to, just to see what it's like. My wife and I really want to go like LARPing just because, and I told her we want to be like, I want to show up as sci-fi characters, be from the future and use guns and murder everybody. And she said, no, I couldn't do that. Bringing new players in or new people into our fold, it would cause a rippling effect. And that's what we've decided is it probably would be too hard. Now, once crit is done and we're able to kind of DM or just make a, an appearance into something that's a little different than being the pinnacle characters and then somebody else watching. Also, I've had people ask about doing like live campaigns, mm -hmm. like live sessions. And I think that we would need to record it and then edit it because we live in a world where it's not, not every joke that we would get as a group maybe would be good for everybody, if that makes sense. Everybody has a, a different situation that they've experienced and things that they're sensitive about. Even at our table, you know, sometimes the guys would say something and I'm like, hey, don't say that. We have those things. And like Terrell, for instance, you can't make a joke about Full Metal Alchemist, right? He stopped watching Full Metal Alchemist after the part where the little girl and the dog get merged into one. But to be honest, I mean, they're each other's best friends. They, they are, but it's a, I mean, it is one of the saddest moments you've ever watched in TV, right? Especially when she pops back up, you know, brother. He, he can't even handle when we throw a meme in there, right? He gets mad. 
you know, just thinking about that on a global level, you put this live, you put, allow people to watch it, especially having a character like Brad, who is caliber. He is nothing but witty and sarcastic all day long. And while we know what he means and what his sarcasm is, and if he says something that might be a little bit out of line, it's nothing. He's just, he's just being sarcastic. Whereas somebody else might not know that about him as a person and take it out of context. I think it's best to leave it as an edited or else you won't get the full effect of, you know, the game. While yes, it's great to be able to edit those moments out. Sometimes those moments are what get you, get us into that role playing mode. And then you get the, the crazy stuff like pretending to be drunk and high and beating up guards, you know, like, there's actors out there that I, I watch a lot of these live campaigns going on. It's an envy. Like, wow, you guys can go in and actually do this well without, you know, making asses of yourself. I can guarantee you if Crit did it, we would take total asses of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh. I mean, uh, as a child, I, I said a lot of choice words to my mom growing up. And I remember her always saying, you know, she always used to tell me, you can't take back the things that you say. You can say, I'm sorry for an action. Actions happen. But words, they go through a different process. Sometimes an action is something where we reacted to something or we're just in motion. She said, with words, you have, they, they start in the brain and they make it to your mouth before they come out. And so they have more power than... You know, somebody just reactively punching in the face, for instance, like I've been hit before, you know, I've done something stupid and someone's punched me and I'm like, oh, sorry, you know, you made me mad, right? It was a reaction to something that had happened. Whereas with words that we speak, they're spoken, they're there, and now they're out forever. I think that a lot of people don't understand the impact that you have just with a few words. So it's good to think before you speak. And she taught me that at a very young age. I said some really mean things growing up. I regret them, sadly, but she had passed away a few years ago. And I, you can't ever take that back. You can't ever say sorry enough when you hurt someone's feelings with words. You know, a, a, a physical pain goes away. It really does. I've been hit by a car. I was in wrestling. I, I've done tons of stuff to hurt myself growing up. But, and even my, I'll, I'll use my child as an example because. Uh, as a 39 year old man, yeah, I've been through a lot, but even an 11 year old kid, she comes up to me all the time and she's like, Oh, I have like seven scars. And then like next week, it's like, I have 10 scars. I got hurt, you know, and she cries, but then she gets over it. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I have a scar. Right. And she counts them, but the pain isn't there anymore. She still remembers the only time I've raised my voice at her and yelled at her. And she was in tears in that moment. And in my defense, I thought she was downstairs. I didn't know she was right behind me. And I did a guttural yell to get her attention. And it scared the crap out of her. And to this day, she remembers how that felt. So she says, I never want you to yell at me because that was the scariest moment for me. So 11 years old, she was six when that happened. She still remembers what it felt like to be yelled at when I didn't even mean to yell at her. Imagine the weight that it would carry if I really did yell at her about something and maybe said something out of anger towards her, she would hold on to that her whole life. So, sorry, that was a really long and emotional response, but uh, I've had quite a few instances of learning what words can do to somebody. It's all good to be creative, but when we dive down to it, when we dive into our, our own personality and, and what makes us us, you know, not many people get to talk about it. That's why I started this show. I mean, I want to dive into the creative process of people and, and their mentalities. And this is part of my questions when I ask for my documentary, Little Person Amongst Media Giants. I want to know what makes creative people tick because I'm not at your level when it comes to art yeah. or writing or anything like that. I have my own skill sets. You have your own skill sets. But if we can learn something from ourselves in some way, shape or form, no matter what it is, whether it's through these questions or whether it's through experiences that maybe you haven't thought of in a while, let's dive into it. I, I've, so I've traveled the world. I've been, I literally got up one day and just went and pitched like the coast of Australia, um, like, you know, touring, um, 
and with my band, I, I've met thousands of people throughout my life. And as a child, my mother always, I, I moved, I moved a lot. I went through three first grades. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell you how many times we had to move when I was a kid. And every time we'd be on the road, you know, we didn't have smartphones. I didn't have a tape. We were, we were poor. Um, and I would just sit, sit there and look out the window. And there for a while, I tried to read a book or like do something. And she said, no, just, just watch your surroundings. And I said, well, what do you mean? Boring. It's the same tree over and over again. And she said, yeah, but there's always something different about every tree. And I, as a kid, you know, you don't really pick up on stuff like that. And I kept asking, like, well, why do I care about what's different in a tree? And she said, well, you meet a lot of different people in life. And even though they look, look alike, they sound alike, they act alike, they're all different in a little way. And she always told me, pay attention to what makes people different, you know? And I still use that. My wife laughs at me because like we went and saw corn last night, you know, I haven't seen a live concert and God knows how. Long. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm people watching. She goes, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know. I just people watch. And that's something I do generally. I, I'm the guy that I'm quiet in a room and I pay attention to what everybody's saying, what everybody's doing, because even though you might have the same interests and you might look the same, you might dress the same, all this different stuff is the same. There's going to be something that's happened to you or around you or some kind of experience that you've had that makes you react different to something. And, you know, that's something that I, I believe firmly we, no one really pays attention to anymore, especially now that we have social media, we're willing to go online and put whatever we want out there not realizing that, yeah, you might think this is a good idea now, right? But I'll tell you what, as someone who had social media 10 and 15 years ago, and I go back, I'm like, why did I post that, right? We all do that. The social media has been around long enough to go like, why did I do that? And I think as we get older and we experience how those things affect other people, right, that we have a little bit better understanding. You know, going back to music, um, we're about to do a final reunion show this October. And I haven't been part of other reunion shows, neither have a couple other guys. You know, we had a few different member changes during the time period we were a band. And when the band ended, one of the reasons was is because our singer made some choices that were not okay. He did some things that none of us were okay with. And even trying to book this show, we were heavily requested and the booking agency contacted us and said, I'm okay with you guys doing this, but you can't do it with him. And you will have to make a formal denouncement of him and his actions. And, you know, this was almost 10 years ago that some of this stuff had happened. And I reached out to him directly just to say, Hey, we're doing this without you. And his words to me, well, you know, he's gone through a lot. He still tried to, you know, he tries to be upset about it, but he said, you know, I can't take back what I did and, you know, something I have to live with for the rest of my life. And that that's just as simple as playing a show that people are saying, hey, throwing money at a venue to say book this band and he still can't play the show because of the moral reasons behind it. Had he had a time machine to go back and say, hey, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Like I can guarantee you that he, he would not have done that. Right. Um, I think it's safe for all of us to start thinking a little bit more now that we have social media, we have these easily accessible information types, the, the, the stuff spreads faster now than it ever has. Right. And you can screw up once and your life is now over that my, you know, my old singer, this was a few years ago. He had to, he lost his job. He lost his house. He lost all of his friends. Okay. In a matter of, Days after this information came out, he lost everything. And he is a nobody in the grand scheme of things, right? But it was even hard for him when he moved 12 hours away to find people that accepted him for what he had done. And I'm a firm believer as well that we can redeem ourselves. You know, I, I you can go into philosophical or an emotional or religious aspect. Nobody in the world can tell you that you can't try to redeem yourself. Now you might not forgive them or someone else might not forgive them. But I think that if we're trying to be better people, there's, there is a light, you know, people that can't accept their faults. It's a different story, but I do, I do hope um, that people can find redemption if they're seeking it. 
And we don't always have those choices. We don't always have those um, abilities. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just think about that when you're about to do something. A friend of mine recently started a channel to protect children in our area. He's actively out there with a group of people. Like, remember that show, To Catch a Predator? Mm -hmm. He's bringing it back via, you know, the internet. He's got like 5 million followers on social media. And he's using his social media presence to do something good yeah. by getting these people noticed. And I can guarantee you every single one of those guys that he's exposed so far, wished they never responded to that message. Right. Or wish they like, and you can't take that back. So just think, you know, when, Hey, is this something I should be doing? Right. I try to do that because uh, more, more not, not for like moral reasons, but like when I'm <clears throat> doing anything in life, it's like, should I really do this? Is this something I really want to do? Cause, um, you know, we all, we all go through different emotional parts, right? Like I've been, um, angry some days and you do something stupid, you say something stupid, you know, like I got into a fight with my wife one day and I wanted to yell and scream and do this stuff. I'm going to walk away. I'm just going to walk away. Why are you walking away from me? Well, because I don't want to say something stupid. You know, I, I really want to put my hand through the wall, right? This was recently. I was at, I was mad, not at her, just in, I had a real rough day. Two full-time jobs and one of them is in taxes. And let's just say that makes you want to put a hole in the wall some days. And so I'm looking and I'm angry and she goes, you look real mad. I'm like, yeah, I want to punch a hole in the wall. And she goes, well, don't do that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to because then I have to fix the hole in the wall, right? <laughs> But the bad thing is you don't always get the chance to fix that whole wall. So definitely think before you act and speak. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Artistically, I would say, well, uh, comic book wise, Todd McFarlane, uh, the man never said no, that the man never gave up in the face of any adver adversary uh, adversity. And, um, I, I listened to most of his YouTube stuff. Like I literally searched up every interview I could on the man when I first started doing this a couple of years ago, because I knew that he had faced a lot of no's in his life. So he really inspired me to say that I could go out there and do this. Um, the other people in my life, uh, you know, my, my family, my mother, and my father always pushed me to just, just to go out there and do it. Uh, my father as a child always told me, um, if I tell myself I can't do something, then I can't. And I won't go into the long-winded version of the story because there was a huge story behind this. But I learned one summer that even though I think I can't do something, if I try hard enough, I can. And um, that was when I was 12 years old. And I'll tell you what I have. It said I can't do something ever since. From a professional perspective, you have created multiple comic books. You have an ongoing D&D campaign, which is amazing in itself. You have a great group of friends and a wonderful family as well too so professionally you are successful do you consider yourself personally successful i i think anything that um garners the the notoriety that even one person then you're successful i think that people i believe that failure is when you give up and so even if I had zero people backing my books and zero people interested in what I was doing the fact that I'm continuing to do it makes me successful. Uh, if I had, if I had taken my wife's, this is okay. The first time that she looked at the book and all that effort I put into it and I put it down and found something else to put effort into, that would be a failure. So I think the minute that I went past that point was when I knew I'd be successful. And it, like I said, it doesn't matter how much money we make on Kickstarter, how many books we send out. Um, just the fact that we continue to do this, um, makes it successful the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failures i don't know failure i don't allow myself to necessarily fail i can fall down and i'm not just saying this i've been told this by many people that know me and even have only known me for a short amount of time um i'm the guy that if i fall down i'm going to get back up and i'm going to continue on uh the, I, I didn't even know guitar when I joined the band that I was in. I lied to them and told them I did. And I figured that as we went. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to fail. I only know how to get what I want. 
The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And in fact, you have the younger generation with you. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Just continue to do what they love and be passionate about it and never put down someone else that's trying to come up um, because we all start somewhere just because maybe you've done it differently or done it better doesn't mean that somebody else is going to be able to do it differently or better than you and just just continue to be the best version of you that you can be and hopefully that will inspire someone else to come behind you and be the best version that they can be and you know, continue on this world that we have called indie comics and the indie creators of the world can be inspired by each other and just how uh, willing they are to accept others and help each other grow. Before I let you go, <laughs> where can we find you? How can we support you online? When is the Kickstarter ending? So you can find me at homebrewedcomics.com. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. You can also go to Instagram slash homebrew comics. I'm always on there. I have a Twitter, I have a Facebook, I have those things. I don't really utilize them as much as I should. I've gotten the best out of Instagram and my personal website. The Kickstarter links are on both of those. So if you right on the landing page for the website, you can click it and find um, the Kickstarter. If that doesn't suit your fancy, you can also just search crit C R I T on Kickstarter to find all six books. The first chapter right there, which was funded in 26 minutes. Uh, I was blessed on that. And the Kickstarter ends April 1st, and that is not an April Fool's joke. That is just the day that ends. Um, I'm going to be doing a live end of the campaign to kind of recap and talk about some of the successes that we've had and go over some of the, the winning uh, entries we've had in some of our art contests. So April 1st, it ends. Right now we are, last time I checked, $82 away from our second stretch goal. And um, some awesome stuff in there from stuff. Stuffed cats, and we didn't go into this little guy, but uh, he is an alcoholic, cigar smoking cat and a top hat, and he's probably my favorite character. So if you want to check him out, go check out Crit homebrewcomics.com. Well, like I said, Chris, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking.